firstly, um, Logan, take us back to the, be the beginning of the germ of the idea for, for Operator and uh, the development of the story. Uh, the germ of the idea probably started with the main character uh, and the psychology behind the main character. Um, and then I had to figure out what uh, profession that would fit into, what the relationship would be around that. Um, and as I was developing the project, so Sharon and I are married. We've been together for 17 years. <laughs> um, and so, you know, within a relationship and both being creative people, you help each other with projects, but we'd never officially worked on something together. So as I was um, developing the project, I would bother her before work every morning and ask her how the pages were looking and talk about ideas. And uh, then we were invited to submit to uh, the Sundance Screenwriters Labs. And I had three weeks to finish the screenplay, had about two thirds of a screenplay and just said, hey, we should officially do this. We've, we're basically doing this together anyway. This is, you know, the, the lines are blurry when you're married, creative people, uh, so let's just make it official and make the credits clear and let's write this together. So that's how the, the screenplay started. Um, and what about um, the balance of the character, the main character, who you describe as a, what are you, self, what's oh, a self-quantifier? A self-quantifier. Uh -huh. uh, and the technology that uh, he's developing, how, how are you balancing the two there in the project? Sure. So again, I, I would say the psychology of the character start, started first. And then um, I come from sort of a science background. My dad worked in artificial intelligence, and both of my parents worked in language. Uh, my mom is a philosophy professor. So those ideas were around. So the first idea we had was um, giving him the profession of designing digital customer service agents. And this is in 2011. So this is pre-Siri and based on kind of, uh, honestly, based on an Amtrak voice um, named Julie, who was one of the first personalities given to uh, digital technology, um, and thinking that that was just a good place to talk about human psychology, because it's so minimal and uh, can't be a person, but we have such a strong reaction to want to anthropomorphize anything that um, you could find yourself attaching to something like that. So we used to take Amtrak when we lived in the Midwest, um, and so we called and we were familiar with Julie, and then at some point one of us found an article we read that people had begun calling Amtrak corporate headquarters asking to speak to Julie, mm -hmm. and that they were experiencing this problem where people who were not ultimately booking tickets were spending a lot of time on the phone with Julie. <laughs> <laughs> and so they theorized, and then eventually you know, did some research and found out that people were calling to talk to Julie. Um, even though all she would do, you know, she didn't have any conversational function. All she would do was ask you where you wanted to go, and where you, you know, how you wanted to get there, and which line. But sometimes you, that's enough. But sometimes that's enough. <laughs> well, and sometimes it's more than real people. Certainly part of the germ of the idea was sometimes that's more than real people will do for you. Um, so, it, I think that Logan had a psychology and a character she was building, and then we, we came across this sort of tiny little article that suggested this world to us that had not really hit the major cultural you know, consciousness yet. Uh, the idea of AI digital assistance was not pervasive. It was something only f fringe technologist people had uh, on their private systems. Um, and then I think you came up with the self-quantifying, which was called self-quantifying at that time, and then it's now called like a Fitbit or an Apple Watch. Yeah, and um, when, we, we first, when we first began to pitch the film, people found the behavior where he tracks his own fitness and sleep data to be really alienating. They said, I don't know if we can identify with this character, I don't know if we can follow him, he's so obsessive, is this a disorder? Um, and then halfway through our development process, everyone received a Fitbit for Christmas and suddenly that problem went away. <laughs> That's awesome. Experimenter is a little different because it's uh, fe featuring a... Uh, work that's already been done, right? Uh, the work of Stanley Milgram. Um, can you tell, tell us a little bit how you became involved in the project? Because I know it started with Michael, right? The writer-director Michael Almadera. Almereda. Do you want to talk about that, Michael, first? So Michael Almereda received the Tribeca Sloan Grant and a Sundance Sloan Grant. And uh, I think I was there for the Tribeca Sloan Grant. We were sitting there in the audience together. Uh, we met at a Sundance 2000. 13 or 14 party, we had a film called Blue Caprice, which was going to the festival. Um, I was also leaving that party to go to a rap party for The Truth About Lies, which opened yesterday, which was kind of cool. 
Um, and I felt very strong because I was really cool for this moment. And there was Michael standing all alone in a corner and I went over and started talking. And he came to the office, he pitched us a couple of projects. Experimenter, we come from scientists, so Experimenter really drew to us. And we got involved and we just kept pushing. Yeah, it was a long process in the beginning, but then um, got a, one or two first financers involved and it went pretty quickly from there. And, um, and I think it's a really important subject to talk about. And even last night, we, you know, I feel like Milgram story, we, we find ourselves following or being leaders or followers. And I, I, since I've made this movie, I just see it all the time how, you know, people will walk across the street and follow each other and then we get there and there's not, no one's going anywhere. <laughs> like last night, we were all waiting for the shuttle and it was not coming and there was 30 of us outside and all of a sudden I'm like, what's going on? There's no shuttle. So I went inside and tried to arrange stuff and came out and said, everyone call a lift. And, um, but just those, those moments um, that were fascinating to me and then obviously the story was um, Milgram was as a result of World War II and he wanted to prove that people weren't all followers and that Hitler was the anomaly and that these experiments actually you know, pro prove that op the opposite of that. And you know, it was a disappointing experiment for Milgram. He was you know, aghast at actually the, the results. He was, he was hoping for the opposite. Yes. 65% well. right. of humans, 65 to 72% of humans, given an authoritarian situation where a person, a charismatic person in a lab coat tells you to electrocute a human being, um, will listen. Yeah, and they've done the res they did the test two more times since 1962, and the yeah. results were exactly the same. Many, many times, yeah. uh, recently in France. So, and as Amy pointed out, you think you're not one of those people, but you are. And it's not so much that there are leaders and there are followers, it's more that 65% of the time you will fall into what's called the agentic trance, and you will listen to authority. And it's a trance, and I watched Amy come out of it. Like, we were all just sort of standing there. I was still in it. And she just came <laughs> like, out of what's it. What's going on? Why are we all standing here? There is no shuttle. <laughs> so, and you just go and you try to change it up and figure it out. But it's, um, it's really fascinating. And his work is, is so important, I think. And it's so important to recognize it. And um, Especially in this climate where following, you know, you can go off a cliff. Leads to bad things. Yeah. And... Yeah, we, we, we're gravitating towards authoritarianism as well. But that's a, a conversation for another day. <laughs> yes. um, let's talk a little bit about science advisors that you worked with on, on both these projects uh, for Operator first. Sure, so we had a couple different science advisors. The main person was at a company called Nuance, which uh, developed all the technology behind Dragon and Siri. Um, so they had been doing voice recognition software for a while. And we got connected to somebody there who, I feel like they weren't, they didn't really know what we were doing. We kind of got under the radar and then we got a lot of access because of that, which was really wonderful. Um, and he just, the, we worked with this guy for a couple of years and he loved the film and he was like, I'm so glad you guys are making a film about me. And so that, <laughs> and he's, He's more of a, he runs the groups of, of people who develop the technology and sort of teams of psychologists and, and technical people and people doing visual interface. Um, so, and he's just happy all the time about everything and curious about everything. So it was a perfect person to talk to and he would help us go and meet with his teams. Um, and yeah, it was, it was a like, I don't know the plural for osmosis. It was like a sort of osmosis experience of he, we would bring stuff to him and he'd be like, how did you know we just had a meeting about that? And then he would tell us things that they were developing. So it was, it was a wonderful kind of checkpoint to make sure that we were staying on track with technology and science. And by being allowed to, to go between our, our first draft, which had gotten into the Sundance Lab and sort of our second big draft, new characters developed. You know, we, we went and we met his teams. We saw who actually builds these teams, what, what clusters of specialty people need to come together to build one of these um, startlingly convincing robots. Um, and so when you, when you look at our trailer and you see the team sitting around the desk, those are people that developed directly from observed people that we met and hung out with. Um, and I mean, that's an example. And, and then as the script developed and developed, we would, we'd call and be like, we have this idea, we need it for the plot. 
Is yeah, that a real? You, can you hack into somebody's phone yeah. just by putting an app onto it, and then can you control it and then shut it down? And he was like, hmm. hmm. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, so then we would just run tech that we needed for plot or emotional reasons by him, and he would terrifyingly confirm that all that existed or would exist within six months. Harold well, Takushian was our science okay. advisor. He was a student of Stanley Milgram's, a grad student. Um, he was a social scientist of some renown on his own. He also ran the Stanley Milgram fan club, which was really kind of neat. What we got deep into, you know, these films have specialized communities and all modern marketing sort of dictates that you reach out to those specialized niches and, and try to pound them. So Harold, got us in there and we were talked about in social science circles and it was really cool. Uh, as a student, he was useful not just in the, the social science but also in, we did a biopic about a man. So Harold knew the man and uh, we interviewed lots of people but Harold was very, very informative. Um, gave us the flavor of this guy who was very brave, very brave. Like as Amy said, he took on things that he didn't want it to be that way. But in the true sense of science, he found a result that he didn't want it, and he faced it. And it was cool. Um, Stanley's wife was alive and was involved in the, in the process of the film as well. So we really got to get her perspective and the stories of her husband. And she never remarried, and it's a very sort of beautiful you know, romance. And um, so we got that inside, insider. So you had her blessing for the project. Blessing, and she was on set, and, and it was great. Did you get his we, life we, right? We actually he, shot at their house. Oh, we yeah. gave her a good chunk of money, which was kind of cool. Yeah. So you op optioned or like got the rights to his life. Yeah. Um, From the estate. Does, does that, is that necessary that you need to do that with someone who's no longer living? It's complicated. It, if you do interviews, yeah. then yes. Right? Okay. So if you're going to interview people, and like I'm not a lawyer, but I play one on TV. Um, <laughs> So it was the right thing to do. I feel like okay. she was involved, and um, you know, we would go to the house. And we got props and like real objects from there. And, and Michael's all about being as, as authentic as possible. So, um. and it's private archives. So when you're digging into something that's not in the public domain, you really should get some rights to yeah. that stuff. It's so safe. maybe okay. we could have got away with it, but it's, it's but a lot of this stuff is in the public domain. Yeah. So. But then, I mean, it also makes yours kind of the official Stanley Milgram project, right? In yes. case there are rival ones out there? Yeah, in case there were, yeah. Mm. Were there? <laughs> well, not well, exactly. Not there not were, rival, but yeah. We were competing against other social science dark experiment films at Sundance, which yes. I thought was kind of neat. We actually had, there were two Perfect timing. esque films in Sundance Stanford that year. Prison we're like, experiment. really? Right. The, yeah. the chances of that were amazing. Now, <laughs> during the development of Operator, did... Um, Spike Jones, her come out, yeah, very so similar sort of concept. Someone falling in love with an operating system, mm -hmm. developing a relationship. Was did that help you? Was that a bit of a setback? Did it? People feel like you. I think it was. A, done? Yeah, <laughs> it was probably both. It was a setback at first, and and even before it came out, because nobody knew what that was going to be or how people were going to respond. And then when it was a big hit, even though. I think the commonality is really the log line, and that's it. Beyond that, the takes on them are, on the idea is very different. Um, after that, it became a successful comp of like, look, it's in, kind of like what Sharon was saying about um, the self-tracking, that once people had a, a personal association with that, it became less weird and off-putting, and it became more, you know, something to interrogate and want to see, like, you know realized on screen, and so we could use this as a successful comp for people being interested in movies about technology in that way. So it was really interesting to be on both sides of that spectrum throughout the development process. It's almost like people are like have the scientific mind where they can see into the future and people need to see it, like you said, on their wrist, or a movie that exists already before they go, oh, okay, I get it now, right? Mm -hmm. um, talk, can you talk a little bit about the um, fast track? and how that, and the Sloan grant that came with that and how that helped your production. Yeah, um, so that was 2014, I believe. Um, the timeline's a little jumbled, which is the thankful of human memory for diluting all of those things because you don't want to remember every step of your filmmaking process. But um, <laughs> so we had like gullies in, you know, pushing things forward in, in various times throughout the like five year development process. Um, 
And one of them was right after, right before and right after her came out because of what we were just talking about. And so Fast Track was this wonderful moment where, I mean, Film Independent has supported me as a filmmaker ever since I got out of grad school and um, has supported this film for a long time. And Fast Track was a moment where we could do exactly what the title is. We could fast track the project and go and I pitched uh, 60 different people, I believe is what it is. It's, it's uh, three days of 20 meetings each day. Um, and so, you know, if you're fighting statistics and in any filmmaking process, trying to get somebody to basically say they'll marry your idea for a couple of years, um, then you get to just squish those statistics and do it in three days and be like, okay, I just need a couple of these things to hit. So out of that, it, it, it happened to be where a lot of elements came together. We um, met a person who would become another producer on the project, um, got connections at agencies, and had an agent who then followed the project for like a year and a half to two years and cast maybe two thirds of the film. Um, and then met somebody who introduced us to the person who was our sole financier. So um, I'm not saying that's gonna happen to every Fast Track project, but it was just the place where you know the timing was right, the people there were right, um, and we had a lot of success from that. So it really vaulted it into production. So you have one, one investor for the project. Yeah. And what's the budget of the film? Or um, can you on, tell us the budget of the film? Is? <laughs> can we tell the budget? Under a million. <laughs> Under a million. <laughs> Um, and the financing for Experimenter came from which sources? Oh, that was so complicated. Um, there was a but in a nutshell. Okay. <laughs> um, they started out um, with a group of investors um, up north um, that were going to invest and then ended up not investing. Um, and then Jeff Rice, um, who's a friend um, we've done some projects with, came on board and really, really supported the project and helped introduce it to two, three other investors. So that group came together. Um, Danny uh, Abascar also came involved. He was one of the early people involved. So it was this sort of different groups of people and trying to make it all fit as it were. Um, there were some, some things were gonna come in, some things we thought were gonna be there and then fall out. Um, so it was, it, was, it was complicated. We can talk about that. So da Danny thought he would be the last money in. Right. And then Turns out he was first. first money in, um, but you know, you know, just some details. You found out about it at Sundance, um, incidentally. Yeah. <laughs> when so it was too late to pull out. It was. Like, yeah, it was actually. Yeah, it was pretty. It was pretty complicated. There were about six investors, and um, you know, going in, the the terms were a little different, and we had to, you know, make all the puzzle pieces fit. And um, nothing has turned me faster into a liar than the financing structure of Experimenter. Yeah. I, mean, I literally would say something that I was sure was true, yeah. and within five minutes, it was no longer true. Um, but it's just... But it went the, pretty quickly. I think it was like fi uh, five months. Well, of, you're, like, there was a whole period before that where we went through a mountain of investors as well. So it yeah, was... for about a year, actually. Yeah, yeah, there was a year, and I know there was something... I think it was January. We, we've been producing together for 20 years, which is pretty awesome. And there was a, a moment we kind of, we check in, we're like, okay, we've got all these projects. Which ones, like this one's been going for a while, are we still committed? And we both were like, this project's one of our favorites. We have to try to make this. And, um, and she did all the lifting. I, there was a lot of heavy lifting on this one. Um, and, uh, and then someone, you know, you, you need that one person to dig in and make the commitment. And then you tell that story to other people and you try to see which one's going to come in first. And it's a... It's a, it's a tough, this was a tough puzzle, man. This one was really hard. What you said about the 60 people, like that's, mm -hmm. that's minimum, right? 60 minimum yeah. to make a movie, that's sort of miraculous, actually. This was like year three of pitching to people. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I yeah. just yeah. want to totally. jump in and say for the filmmakers in the, the audience, in the early years when we were coming right out of the Sundance Labs and, and, and Logan and I were new to LA um, and just out of graduate school, graduate film school, um, we would go to meetings with producers and they would say this thing that was really confusing to us. We didn't know what was happening. They'd say, we love your project, we love your script, we're very, very interested. Call us when something happens. And, and, we, and we were like, what, what do yeah. you mean? And they're like, well, do you have a producer? And we're like, you? <laughs> <laughs> like, we're here, you're a producer. 
you like our script, she's a great director, we have this short she's made, she's incredible. Like, we, we would have these conversations that were totally mysterious to us, and that, so I don't know where you guys are in your process, but what they're saying is everyone wants to be the second person to give you money. Yeah, first is the, the right? artist, and, and so, so you what might have to, like, What they meant, which bit. we didn't even understand, was like, when someone else gives you even $100,000, call us and we might give you the next $100,000. Do you know what I mean? But we literally didn't, they were speaking English, but we didn't even understand. You know, we, and we kept calling people and being like, what does that meeting mean? They said they wanted to produce our film, but not yet, and to call them later, we just, I don't know, someday, like, I don't want to burn too much time, but I will say, like, yeah. sitting next to you, now we know exactly what you mean, but I remember distinctly five years ago being like, I would sit and pitch to you, and you would say things, and I literally didn't know what you were saying, and now I'm, I'm trying to explain so, yeah, what so they when mean. You Everyone wants producers? to be the second person to give you money. It's a little bit of a different have, language. Have stuff, yeah. like, have stuff going on, because, yeah. like, the worst thing is you're just like, agent. I just got a script. <laughs> So, yeah, just make make up good stuff. So, so what Sloan was such a huge part of it. So Sloan came in for two development grants. Then they were offering us a production grant, which was big one. a big amazing. one. And it was amazing. We go first. Our specialty is we're the only Yeah. 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 And that's that, 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 And that was part of, of getting these first investors. And then, as you know, it was very complicated. Um, there was we, a, we weren't able to take we that weren't able to particular take it. chunk of money. Um, it was a sort of a, a union, non-union kind of issue. And we were right on that edge. And if we chose one, the, the m amount of the grant would pretty much just pay for fringes. And so it was just with these things, we had to decide to stay under under a certain level. And but then we they were, were able to say we had a $300,000 grant from Sloan. And yeah. that made people. And that like is that is what interested. attracted a lot of those investors. And then we had to go back. Sort of a lie at the time, but we it didn't was, know it. Well, you know, you say what you <laughs> get the commitment, and then figure out the details. Um, and then from there, they were lovely, and we ended up getting the distribution grant. I think it was the first one from Sloan and uh, from Film Independent and Sloan collaboration, and that was just it's amazing because um, we can talk about that for a long time. But as you guys probably know, distribution is. You know, you think you're you're home free in the beginning of the days where you, you make your movie and then you get a distributor and you're like, awesome, I'm done. I arrived and just so the beating not the is case. just about to begin. Yeah, like you it's just it's the next layer and that distributor, no matter who it is, is not gonna care as much as you do about your movie and they are not gonna press and they are not gonna market as much as you want. So to have extra help from on the filmmaker side, which is what this was to help give extra money to those niche audiences, to Psychology Today, to specific science-oriented Facebook ads, to the, those audiences that are so important that care about Stanley Milgram, that have heard of Stanley Milgram um, beyond just the normal blast out that everything everybody gets. Those That extra money and that extra help is it's just huge. And I would recommend everybody in the beginning of your process of making movies to do that yourself. Get those get those niche audiences. Start thinking about that. Start getting your marketing and your social socials going. Like from the beginning, like the very very beginning. Like it's it's just it's huge. It, the landscape has changed so much since I started making movies. And it definitely made us think about it differently. And we we remain yeah. shadow distribu distributors to our distributors. Hence from that Sloan Independent yeah. grant, and we just released a movie and we bought our own Booker. Right, so we yeah. got our own Booker and added it, who added you know, twenty times the amount of theaters than the the distributor was interested in. And, and we got our own publicist and yeah. we brought in our own. It's marketing so important team. to start thinking about that and and um, yeah, on another project or sort of building like a grassroots theatrical on our own and set up a whole different side thing and like that is where the business is going yeah. and um, you know there's a select group of you know independent distributors that. Um, will actually spend a little money on your movie, and there's a lot that don't, so you have to start thinking that way now, and it's just a whole other skill set. But Never so, ends. Never, ever ends. <laughs> Making movie is a long process. But sure. Yeah. It's a well, I just wanted, not a, yeah. about um, distribution, although we could talk about that too, but I just wanted to say, we so the second Sloan grant we got, we took a big chunk of it and paid our own casting director. And so Logan had already connected with this financier, and again, as filmmakers, as enthusiastic and energetic filmmakers, we'd be like, great, when do you send us the money? And he was like, hmm. Uh, and, and what he needed was a high profile cast attachment. He needed to know that his investment, the money he was gonna give us, 
was going to be attached to the sort of actor who could then cause people to see the movie, buying it on VOD or in theaters. Um, and so to connect with that kind of actor, we needed a casting director. So we took a big chunk of our second Sloan grant, paid a casting director, and she began connecting us to agents, doing, um, you know, calling people in for secondary roles and first roles, to thinking about, you know, who, who is this couple at the center of our film? And I would say that, so that was the way in which our second Sloan grant triggered the money, although it was different. They didn't come in with enough money to attract other money. It was enough money to buy a person who would attach the cast member who then attracts, who then sort of seals the deal on the money, so. Well, in our, you know, we have one investor, but he came in initially for half of the amount of the budget, so we thought we were gonna be finding the other half, and if you read the case study, you can learn more about the details of where we thought we were gonna find that, and the ins and outs of various things folding, and him eventually becoming our sole investor. Uh, so at that point, we had half the money, and we thought, oh, that's definitely enough to like make things happen, but, the, Sharon's talking about like words you don't understand when you go into these processes, and there's all these LA words like momentum and buzz and heat, and I was like, well, what do those things mean? <laughs> and so these are all of the like meaningless words that you have to continue to generate while you're you know trying to make your project seem real because nobody other than you, and this is kind of a through line. You guys are talking right. about distribution. You're always going to be most invested in your project. That's through. That's true throughout the entire pr process. That you have to keep pushing everything forward, make it seem like a train that's moving or whatever other analogy you want to use. Um, and then people will want to join that because they're excited that something's happening and they want to be a part of something that's happening. They don't want to generate something. Exactly. Like oh. they don't want to be the first train, for the, yeah. the first car. They want to be in the middle or exactly. the end. And I will say as a, as a so t together you're looking at co-writers, director, producer and then we had some other producing partners but like that core team having endless determination energy and belief in the project is the only thing that gets it made and and having a team is really helpful if you're sitting here alone congratulations you're very very talented but get a team because also like you do flag on the run. It can, takes a long time to generate a movie and you need your team members to lift you up. If you're having a down day and there's a meeting scheduled, you cannot afford that. Guess what, your team makers lift you up, you keep running. So there's also just a, the team quality of this is so important because it's a long run and you have to never, ever, ever lose faith and lose hope. And, and since we are human, sometimes we do and so those other people carry you. And then since um, Film Independent and Sloan are awesome, sometimes they carry you. <laughs> When you're working with big name actors though, you're, you obviously have to work around their schedules so that, that gives you certain windows where you can shoot, but it also forces you to set a start date, right? Yeah. Setting a start date can often be the key to just building momentum and just creating urgency, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's, a, that's kind of a trick I think a we do. ticking clock we call yeah, it. Yeah, we call it the ticking clock and like that's such a huge part of it. Like that's the a biggest part of it. Like you just, you choose the date and you run towards it and it, it creates that momentum because you could just sit there and loop Always and loop. push one week. And loop all, yeah. <laughs> you could just keep going and going. It's like you have to decide, okay, like we're going to go towards this date and if something haps, happens or collapses, which it will, then we'll push. But like you've got you've to gotta set that date and that's super important. I mean, Eventually, we just moved yeah. to Chicago and brought our cinematographer and began pre-production. Just Great. believed that it was yeah. going to come together by that moment. You know? It really works. You just jump. Well, it, it takes a lot of intestinal fortitude um, <laughs> to start making a movie before you're fully financed. And we do it once every four or five movies. Um, I'm doing it, we're doing it right now. So hopefully the last payroll will clear. <laughs> it's very stressful. <laughs> So you guys are a great, like, uh, <laughs> the comedy duo is very clear to me here. I get the They're dynamic. Awesome too, okay. <laughs> this is the we first night of your really tour, right? <laughs> it's the first night of your tour. Yeah, yeah that's exactly. Uh, briefly talk about production. How, how, how many days did you shoot, each of you? Uh, 20 days. Uh, mm -hmm. Entirely on location in Chicago. Yeah. And Experimenter was... We're confirming. I'm like, I don't remember. <laughs> um, 20, I think. Over 20. 21, 22-ish. <laughs> 20 to 22. <laughs> Not is, entirely on location, though. There were some sets in We shot right, a lot on stages. the sets. Yeah, yeah, actually, the old Pfizer building in, in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Um, I love being on a set. It's amazing, like, having the, the stage and having the actual build. And you can just 
cozy up there and get everything set up and you can just walk away at night and come back the next day and walk away and come back. It, it had to have floors yeah. strong enough that a 4,000 pound elephant could walk on it. Yeah. I wanted to ask about the oh, elephant. That Mini. That's not stock footage. You. Would, oh no, Minnie's real. You brought real. an elephant in. Minnie's real. Minnie. She was our, everyone's favorite day. <laughs> It was the, my favorite it's my day favorite day on a set in 20 years, yeah. What, what do you say to Michael when he says, I want to shoot a real elephant? I said, you're crazy. CGI, CGI. Yeah. We'll do it CGI. Okay, I found this animatronic elephant, which we can yeah. get for very little money. We're like, come on, you're doing rear screen projections. Let's just come up with something creative. Animation. We're not going to have a real elephant, Michael. And then I remember calling... We lost that. And called <laughs> animal, animal Trainers in New Jersey, and that elephant was... I did find that. I found many, yeah. She was expensive. <laughs> so we had many for four hours, and it had to be just four hours. So highest paid actor. Highest paid actor on our movie. I'm not supposed to say that out loud, actually. Forget that. <laughs> so sorry. So sorry, Peter and Winona. <laughs> Minnie got more than you did. <laughs> but she always hit her mark, you said, so very professional. Yeah, I have this long story. I'm not going to do it. Okay. But, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, Minnie was, yeah, she was, she was great. We had her in and out in four hours, and... They can ask you at lunch, right, if they want to know more. Yes. Working with elephants. Um, briefly, uh, the, the, your strategy for release um, and a, a festival launch. So we were the uh, second recipients of the Sloan Distribution Grant, and uh, we had not considered, we, we went to South by Southwest, we were extremely well received there, we had interest from distributors, one of them purchased the rights to distribute our film, and, and again, as first time filmmakers, we're like, terrific, now they're in charge, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> and you know, and then you, you have to really think about how do I reach the, the, the micro communities of people who will make this movie a success, and so, the grant threw me particularly into research mode. And, uh, you know, we debated, um, you know, do we need a theatrical run when our distributor was like, this is a perfect VOD film, which, which it was because our, our leads are famous on television um, and uh, people are used to accessing their content, their fan bases are, are used to accessing them through small screens and uh, on their computer and streaming. Um, but you know we're filmmakers, and Logan shot this film so beautifully, um, and we wanted it on bigger screens. So we said, "How can we get it to theaters?" Um, it actually ended up having theatrical in part uh, at a, a theater run by a man who was we we didn't meet him, but we got closer to him at the last Sloan conference. Oh, yeah, that. Russ Collins with the Michigan Theater in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, we, ha we, so we, we threw an opening, which generated a whole bunch of um, photos of our well-known actors in casual clothes, laughing and talking and drinking wine together. Then those photos could be posted on our social media. Do you know what I mean? Like, modern film marketing is so different mm -hmm. than what it used to be. It's not the buying of a thousand posters and putting those up. It's not. Uh, so I just, I had to dig in and learn all about that. And then I had the fabulous ability. We got to sit down with our, The Orchard, who was a wonderful distributor, and say, good news, we brought some money to the table. How do you want us to spend that? In, in that case, they were like, well, since this is a, a new VOD release, it turns out you can mark it on the platforms, you know, that, uh, so we bought something called co-op buys, which are ads that appear on Comcast when someone goes and says, I want to watch a film on Friday night, but I don't know which film. You can advertise inside Compast. And so our film could be advertised right next to huge studio films once it was in that VOD box in people's living rooms. And turns out those are the ads that have the highest return. They're the, they're the, the most people buying your film and watching your film for the amount of money you've spent on the ad. So I had to learn. I didn't, it wasn't something I'd ever thought. Um, at every stage, I would say, I thought, great, the professionals have arrived and now they will run the film. <laughs> Um, and then what you discover is filmmakers, and if you love your project, A, that's never a good idea, and, and B, the more minds are always better, and so you have to lean well, in, you're you the learn. professionals. Yeah, and, and well now we're the professionals. You yeah, you know, but, um, and so yeah, it, it brought me up at least, and be like, oh, now I, I'm a film producer because I produced a film. <laughs> right. And I learned what I needed to know, and now the film is out there in the wild, having an amazing artistic life, and our, our, our our distributor, The Orchard, says that um, our film is the best VOD release they've ever had. 
Mm -hmm. um, awesome. That didn't also have, you know, an enormous theatrical. And I think that's because we went and had some money to spend on VOD advertising. Seeing that's a film right. out into the world is part of being a producer nowadays, really. Yeah. You, you know, it's n you're not done when you rap. I know. Um, Experimenter played Sundance, was picked Sundance. up by Magnolia, Magnolia. Mm -hmm. and you had a Sloan distribution grant as well. Yep. Um, and talk a little kind bit of about a similar, getting it out into kind of a world. similar um, story. We brought it to them. They uh, Magnolia had already um, bought the film, and then we said, "Hey, we have this extra money. Let's talk about how we want to spend it." Um, we were sort of thinking maybe we'd keep it on the side and do just a certain things niche, but then we decided that to coordinate with them was the best way to do it. And it went through, we bought like it's several ads in Psychology Today, which was great. Um, and then Facebook marketing mainly. And then also we had a the sort of college educational tour that also helped pay for it. But their idea sounds really cool. Yeah, I, I was like, that's great, we gotta do that. Um, <laughs> it, where you premiere a film is really, really important. Right, so, so I'm not sure you're all on that, but like your first festival is the important one. That's your world premiere. So we're, we've had, Sundance has blessed us um, with a l number of movies there. So we usually reach out to a programmer, which is a luxury, I guess. So we'll reach out usually to Trevor or John um, and then touch Anne and Anne. Get a lot of, try to get support in every way you can and try to find tastemakers who will push. We had John Sloss with us who's able to make phone calls after we, they stop returning our phone calls um, or emails, and we try to make a case. And so that is how we tend to do it. Michael is a prestigious creature. He did not think we were getting into Sundance. I remember that well. Um, I think I won a dollar. So, <laughs> it, <laughs> and so we, we make a strong case for where we're opening a film. South By is a great festival. We tend to try for, um, uh, Sundance or Toronto or um, Cannes, which we've never succeeded at, um, at or and Berlin. This year, LA Film Festival, which was awesome. And so, where you your world premiere is the most important one. Do not start at a small festival and yes. until you've tried all the big ones, first year and second year. I know that first year is brutal, but just try to ho hold out and get what the what the bigger festival. Because then you're branded like Sloan. Frankly, brand you like these are you're building a brand, right? And that festival becomes a brand. And I, I would I would like to add, I agree with everything he just said. South By was a tremendous festival for us because we were a technology movie, right? It's a technology conference. And so uh, at South By, they needed to add more screenings of our film. Awesome. awesome. But it was, it was a perfect match of film to audience there. So just think about your film. Um, and then the other thing I would say is if what they just said sounds out of your reach as new filmmakers, consider that if you're sitting in this room, film independent, is filled with people who want to advocate for you. So just don't forget to ask for help from the people who are already supporting you as early career filmmakers. They sometimes have contacts that you can utilize that you don't have 20 years of producing experience, but if you're in this room, you already have someone who championed you. So call that person, ask for help. And if you don't get in, just I want to say this too, because we didn't get all our movies into Sundance or one of those major film festivals, then we go to another strategy where we get into a lot of small festivals. Right, so it's not over until you quit. Yeah. Right, you just have to keep going and, and, and bring on collaborators. I mean, if on most movies you see that list of producers is, is not one or two. So just don't be afraid of that. Bring on people that help, that have the experience, that have the relationships. Like, don't be too precious about it. Just if that, if right. that person or that, or that company can help you get to the next place, it's better to be seen and have your film out there than to hold it and it not. We are almost out of time, and we don't. Do we have time for questions? Maybe half a question? No, not even time for half a question. Well, thank you so much. Uh, congratulations on thanks the movie. Thanks, everybody, and thanks, Sloan and Film Independent. Uh,